Good afternoon. I'm Jay Wang, director of the USC Center on Public Diplomacy. I'm very pleased to welcome you to our CPD conversation series. And the topic, uh, uh, the title of today's uh, roundtable discussion uh, is From Distant Neighbors to Strategic Partners, What If the U.S. and Mexico Co-Hosted the 2026 World Cup? I'd like to uh, extend special welcome to uh, our distinguished uh, keynote speaker and our distinguished panel of experts. Uh, so the Center on Public Diplomacy is committed to enlarging and expanding our youth engagement and developing uh, the next generation of public diplomats and citizen diplomats. So as part of the initiative, we are taking steps to broaden student involvement in the center's work. So not just for students at the Annenberg School, but also across USC campus. Uh, this coming fall, we will take our program to students across the country. So I'm very delighted that for today's program, um, we uh, co-sponsor with the USC Political Student Assembly. So the assembly is dedicated to increasing political dialogue on campus by connecting students, and, well, students with political and cultural leaders and thinkers and promoting civic engagement and working on student advocacy efforts. So with us today is the assembly's director, Justin Bogda. Uh, Justin is a senior major uh, with a major in uh, environmental studies and international relations. He previously worked for the U.S. Embassy in Mexico City and is interested in the future of U.S.-Mexico partnership, especially in the energy sector, which is your thesis topic. And so I'd like to invite Justin to introduce our speakers. Justin, please. Hello, everyone. Thank you very much for the introduction, Jay. Um, so Ambassador Sarah Khan, who's with us today, is the chairman of Global Solutions and uh, Apodesta Company, a strategic consulting firm in Washington. A career diplomat, Ambassador Sarah Khan served for 20 years in the Mexican Foreign Service and most recently uh, served as Mexican ambassador to the United States from 2007 to 2013. Previous positions included Deputy Assistant Secretary for Inter-American Affairs, Chief of Policy Planning at the Foreign Ministry, and Mexican General Consul to New York City. He has taught at the Instituto Tecnológico Autónomo de México, uh, the National Defense College, the Inter-American Defense College, and the National Defense University of the United States. In addition to serving on the boards of the America Society and the Inter-American Dialogue, Ambassador Sarah Khan is currently a distinguished affili affiliate at the Brookings Institute. Um, our other speakers tonight, uh, today include Michael Govan, CEO and director of the Los Angeles County Museum of Art, Leon Krauss, journalist and host of Open Source on Fusion.net, Jorge Gonzalez, Vice President for Academic Affairs, Dean of the College and Professor of Economics at Occidental College, and Pamela Starr, Director of the U.S.-Mexico Network and Associate Professor at the USC School of International Relations and Public Diplomacy here. So if you could all give them a round of a hand. Do you want me to kick off? Uh, it's, it's, it's certainly a great pleasure to be back at, at, at my home campus, USC, um, and at the Public Diplomacy uh, center, um, especially with this idea that has been marinating for several years. Um, I've been speaking about this issue that I hope that we can start flushing out today and putting some meat on the bones with this very, very good group of, of, of colleagues who accepted Jay's uh, invitation to, to join us for today, um, Leon, Michael, um, Jorge, and, and Pam very, very distinguished uh, academics, pundits, journalists, and cultural thinkers, entrepreneurs, trailblazers. Um, so I, th I think that we, we invited the mayor uh, because we think that LA should, LA is a logical candidate to embrace an initiative like this. He unfortunately, because of his commitments, could not join us. But I, I think you but by giving you the, the, the profile and the scope of the individuals that we've sort of thought of to trigger this discussion today, you can see where we're trying to head with, with this discussion. Let me, let me um, g given that this is a very select and good group and that we don't have too much time to sort of talk about these things, I'm, I'm always reminded what happened to a senator from the state of New York at the turn of the 
uh, 19th to 20th century called Chauncey Pugh. And he was asked to introduce President William Howard Taft in an event with trade unions in New York City. And this Senator Chauncey Pugh had the reputation of being a long-winded and sort of glib speaker. And so he goes up to the lectern to present President William Howard Taft, and he goes on and on and on and on. And he finally ends his remarks and says, you know, ladies and gentlemen, I have the distinct pleasure to present to you President William Howard Taft, a man pregnant with courage and pregnant with integrity. So President William Howard Taft comes up to the lectern, looks at the senator and says, well, if it's a boy, I'll call her, uh, I'll call her integrity. If it's a boy, I'll call him courage. But if it's just a gas, I'll call him Chauncey Pugh. <laughs> so, having said that, um, let, let me sort of, for those of you who, who joined us in the fall, in my fall engagement with uh, uh, USC and the Public Diplomacy Center uh, in the fall, you remember that sort of I talked about the current status of the US-Mexico relationship and sort of ended with um, underscoring that there was a dichotomy, if not even cleavage, between what I had described as a very positive, forward-leaning, bilateral relationship between Mexico and the United States that developed over the years, and at the same time the contrast between what public opinion in both Mexico and the United States thought about the relationship, and there's, there, there's, a, there, there's, a, great, there's a great divergence between what I think has been achieved in the bilateral relationship and what people think of the bilateral relationship in either Mexico and the United States. And sort of this led to a discussion where I sort of pitched my idea that I've been peddling, that I had been peddling for the last years as an ambassador, which was why don't Mexico and the United States present a joint bid for the 2026 World Cup? 2026, for those of you who aren't soccer as of this moment, this is the last time I'll use soccer. From now on, we're saying football. football. <laughs> and you all know what we mean by that. Yes. Um, as as mo some of you may know, I don't know how deep you are into the politics of, of World Cups and how they get assigned to bidding countries, but uh, Brazil is this year. Russia got the next World Cup in 2018, and Qatar got the World Cup in 2022. So the next available bid that has not been presented or submitted yet is 2026. The World FIFA traditionally has a system, a rotational mechanism, where the World Cup has to move from continent to continent. And the beauty of the 2026 World Cup bid is that it would be the American continent's turn to host the World Cup again. So I, I started talking about this because I thought it was a very compelling idea, not only of how do we create a sense of co-stakeholdership between Mexico and the United States, but how we send a very powerful and equivocal message about what binds these two countries together. And I thought also that it was a compelling idea to present here at the Public Diplomacy Center, because I think that even though we all look at other instruments like social media um, as sort of the new cutting edge of how we implement uh, innovative public diplomacy. I think that uh, the, the World Cup idea could add to the roster of instruments when we think of how these two countries can put together a template for, um, for uh, uh, enhancing public diplomacy. Let me start stating the obvious. Football is never just football. In fact, Barcelona, which I must love USC immensely because we're giving, we're doing this as Barcelona starts playing Real Madrid in a few minutes for the final of uh, the Copa del Rey. So we, 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 Leon and I, we're Barcelona junkies. I'll, I'll keep you posted. I'll keep you posted. You can imagine how, how impressed we are with USC that we're doing it this at exactly the same moment where we could be enjoying a beer and watching the game. But Barcelona's motto is more than a club, mes con club. And I'm, for those of you who don't know, I'm half Catalonian, so this is the, you know, it, it's not even the team that I was raised with. I was in the womb, this, this became my, my team. Um, but football is, is, it's much more than a game or even a way of life. It's a perfect window into the cross currents of today's world. 
And like most other sports, football is freighted with the weight of history, nationalism, a sense of belonging or clan, and even of ancient hatreds. It has launched libertarian movements, propped up dictatorships, or triggered wars. It illuminates the fault lines of global society. Why then use something as passionate, as, as passionate and as sometimes polarizing as soccer to bring these two very disparate countries together? First of all, because I think despite the potential glitches, Japan and South Korea, two countries that also have had historically fraught relationships, were able to pull it off relatively successfully. And so there's a first template. Mexico and the United States would not start from scratch. There is a first template that already exists of two countries as diverse and divergent and with some very vexing current challenges that were able to do it together more or less successfully. So first of all, it's already happened. And again, despite some of its shortcomings, I think it proves that the model is workable from a commercial point of view, from a logistical, logistics point of view, and from the very complex uh, machinery that has to step in to set up in motion something as complex as a World Cup, more so if it's co-hosted by two nations, as it was first done in Japan and South Korea. But what I think makes the story for Mexico and the United States very compelling is that the difference the, the the, similar, the similarities between Mexico and the United States are greater than the differences. And again, for those of you who, who, who were here with us in the fall, let me just very quickly rehash some of the numbers because I think the numbers in the relationship tell a very compelling story of what those similarities and connectivities look like. Trade, again, the uh, partnership between Mexico and the United States means that $1.24 billion a day of goods go across our border in both directions every day. We have one million legal crossings every single day in both directions. We have 75,000 trucks that reach our border in both directions every single day. We have the largest Mexican diaspora living in any country abroad in the United States. We have the largest US diaspora living anywhere else uh, on the face of the earth living in Mexico. We have a growing convergence between societal and demographic patterns on both sides of the border. Look at tourism flows. No surprises. Mexico is the number one destination for US tourists anywhere in the world. The, larger num the largest number of foreign tourists that go to Mexico are from the US. Mexico is the number one foreign destination. Uh, the US is the number one foreign destination for Mexican tourists. We're not the largest number in, in, in total volume. We're second to Canada. But Mexico is second after Canada in terms of the total volume of tourists that come into the U.S. Um, gastronomy. I don't have to tell a city like L.A. what has happened when you look at how gastronomy has shaped everything from tastes to trade to familiarity with the culture of the neighboring country. When NAFTA was being negotiated and I was a junior diplomat at the embassy in the 90s, I remember a lot of people in Mexico were sort of waxing lyrical about how Mexico would, you know, things like Mexican cuisine would be gobbled up by American imperialism. And I remember I told several people, I can bet that sooner or later Mexican gastronomy is going to take over the United States. And it has. Not only that, for the football, American football fans, I think it's a very compelling story that for the last four years now, more guacamole and salsa <laughs> is sold and consumed on Super Bowl day than any other, than hot dogs, hamburgers, etc. So again, gastronomy is, is reshaping the way these two countries interact. And then culture. Look, look at the profound way in which culture, everything from Nordic in the border region, how music is being shaped by cultural influences and musical influences in Southern California and Northern Baja California, how music is shaping uh, the, the culture of both nations, how artists, plastic, performance, how these are being molded and shifted and changed and impacted by cultural tendencies on either side of the border. There is, there is a true ferment of culture, I think, taking place between Mexico and the United States. Sometimes we don't see it. Sometimes it bubbles below the surface. 
but there is a very, very profound change happening. And obviously, in many ways, I think, and I've always said this, so I'm not, I'm not, I'm not blowing smoke up his tush. Uh, I think LACMA and Michael Govan are today, of all the museum institutions in the United States, the one institution that has fully understood these dynamics and are trailblazing the way as to how a museum thinks globally and in a transborder template. Um, think of the Latino community in the United States. Leon and what Univision and now Fusion are attempting to do, which is to reflect these cross-cultural and cross-border synergies, the huge and growing role of the Latino community, of the empowerment of the Latino community in the United States, cultural, economic, political. What all of this does, and I'll, I'll start, I'll start um, uh, uh, wrapping up with this because we've, we've been asked to speak for about 10 minutes each, so I will try and wrap up and then um, have my other colleagues speak and then I'll hopefully open this up for a discussion amongst ourselves, but also with the rest of you. Um, what all of this does at the end of the day, and, and there may be people in the United States and there may be people in Mexico who don't like or enjoy hearing what I'm about to say, but what all of this does, it's, it's leading to a convergence, a real convergence between Mexico and the United States. In values, in our economies, in our trade, in our demographics. Very few countries on the face of the earth, if you look at megatrends, have this convergence that Mexico and the United States have seen, probably since triggered by NAFTA, but which has now deepened beyond just trade and economics, and is changing the way these two countries will interact foreseeably in the coming decades. And this is a very unique transformation. The World Cup obviously also is a public diplomacy soft power tool. It allows those countries that host it to brand themselves, to country brand themselves, to send a message to the world. And so here again, imagine A, when the largest challenge that we have between Mexico and the United States is ensuring that societies on both sides of the border understand that they're co-stakeholders to each other's well-being, security, and prosperity. Imagine, A, what a joint bid for the World Cup could achieve in terms of cementing those transborder ties between those, these two societies, and B, in terms of country branding, I would even say region branding, the unequivocal and extremely powerful message that Mexico and the United States would send to the rest of the world by co-hosting this World Cup in 2026. Do you imagine the message, the geopolitical implications that that message sends to the rest of the world of what Mexico and the United States are about in North America and in the Americas today? This is why I think this is a very compelling message. I think it sends a, an equivocal uh, 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 vision of a common destiny, of a rising tide lifting boats on both sides of the border, and of Mexico finally facing what I think has been beyond the drugs and the thugs and the immigration and the water issues and the border infrastructure challenges and the trade disputes, is at the end of the day the basic fault line that the governments of Mexico and the United States and the peoples of Mexico and the United States need to address, which is do Mexico and the United States continue to be accomplices to failure or do we become partners to success? And I'll end with a quote that will summarize my, my, my itchiness over, over what's happening as we talk about here today. Some people think that football is a matter of life and death. As Bill Shankly, the legendary manager, trainer, coach of Liverpool, my British, I was raised in the UK, in Wales, and so my team in the UK is Liverpool. Um, and uh, there's this old saying that some people think that football is a matter of life and death. Bill Shankly once said, I assure you, it's much more important than that. <laughs> and this is what I hope we can achieve with this fantastic joint bid uh, between Mexico and the United States for the 2026 World Cup. If not before, because given the geopolitical challenges that some of the countries that will be hosting this before then could be facing, we may, we may need to ratchet up the bid sooner, but um, thank you very much. And again, Leon, Michael, Jorge, Pam, thank you for being here, uh, and Jay, thank you for hosting this conversation. Thank you, thank you. Yes, Michael, you want to... Wow. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs>
Thank you, Arturo, for the invitation and to be among these uh, great people. Um, it's a topic we talk about a lot, the U.S. and Mexico. I come at it um, usually from a museum and cultural perspective, uh, but um, I think I was invited today because right now we have on view at LACMA an exhibition called uh, Football, the Beautiful Game. And it is uh, quite, it is prompted by the World Cup, but it was prompted by one of our curators, Franklin Sermons, who's as much of a fanatic as you are, Arturo, about the idea that um, football has become an incredibly central metaphor in a lot of very important contemporary art recently, like in the last five years. And he was sort of asking this question, why? And the exhibition sort of visually poses a simple premise that a uh, question about the, the football, the ball being used as a globe, very much as a metaphor uh, for a globe. And he contends that, you know, it is probably our obsessive interest culturally in the questions of globalization, commonalities, dissimilarities, and passions that are, 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 are grown across teams, borders, cultures, and questions. And so this quite wonderful exhibition, which is just down the street, for all of you should see it, which ranges from images of the, of the ball to, um, to one of the most spectacular, I think, recent uh, displays of, 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 of uh, portraiture. And there are quite a, couple, there are quite a few portraits. And, and portraiture, which is not a sort of common topic you see in museums so often, is so beautifully presented in this exhibition. And all the things you say about football, you sense in the exhibition and by these artists who are mostly young artists thinking about this, some Mexican, but certainly uh, American and global. And uh, I think from a cultural perspective, I look at the future, or I can't look at the future any other way uh, as I talk with artists most of my days or curators or looking at cultures. Uh, there's no way to look at it except that we have a shared future. I mean, I know controversially, occasionally I've said, you know, it is sort of, it should be the reverse a bit of the Berlin Wall, which is a wall that once separated, uh, that, that there is a wall and that it might come down, and that's not a crazy idea. I mean, economists I talk to will tell me that, and you may have something to say about this, that in fact, in this new global economy, we need to be bigger, that to have three to 400 million people under one economy, or 500, would it be a better system just from a prosperity standpoint than what we have now, even with NAFTA and all the, the porousness of the border, and that um, and what might stand in the way of that, what would stand in the way of it, yes, there are political systems and laws and some culture, but that, that those things increasingly seem less important, as we can see in Los Angeles, how cultures coexist uh, quite easily. And cuisine leading the way, when I was at my second board meeting at LACMA eight years ago, I used to I put up on the screen, sort of in terms of our strategic plan, I put the Kogi taco truck up because <laughs> I felt that the sharing of the spice between the you know, Mexican cuisine, which was now huge, and the you know, Korean cuisine, which was growing in the neighborhood, and that this Pacific viewpoint, actually, since we're here in Los Angeles, uh, was so key to thinking about our future culturally, artistically, in terms of cuisine, in terms of thinking, in terms of global outlook, and that Los Angeles is a wonderful metaphor for that. Today we're not talking about Los Angeles, we're talking about something larger about national collaboration, but um, it, it seems to me that this is a, is a very distinct possibility that this would be a way of acknowledging the passions, as you say, that exist across borders occasionally, in culture and otherwise, and a way of seeing them as being able to be integrated and to see once you've crossed that threshold of passion and deal with that, that all the other practical things look like our future, the future of the U.S. and Mexico is tied completely together. Um, and, and not to underestimate, I think, the value of, of, of football. Um, the great uh, philosopher and novelist uh, Camus, uh, said, I think, that he learned everything, not from politicians or, or philosophers, Oops. but from 
football. Totally. And he yeah. played for Algeria, and he played in, in France. And that sentiment uh, is, is that, that football is part of culture and that it leaks in all kinds of ways into every aspect of life um, is an interesting way to deal with something that's very fundamental to issues like national security and, and prosperity in a way that can be, I think, uh, athletic, but also in a, in a cultural sense, can, can think about globalism in this cultural way. So, I think it's a fantastic idea. I said I'm signing up on the dotted line wherever, <laughs> whatever I can do, and I can't think of it. And maybe that's for discussion. A single reason why it wouldn't be the most spectacular idea that we could put forward, and uh, given the current politics, maybe you can advance that more quickly. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Very much. Um, Oh yeah, you wanna yeah, absolutely. And uh, hey, thank you so much for inviting me. I'm thrilled to be here. And uh, my daughter's a junior at USC. And uh, so when I told her I was coming, she was very embarrassed. But thankfully, <laughs> <laughs> thankfully she's studying abroad in Spain. So she said, "Okay, you can go because I'm not on campus." So I'm thrilled to be here. And when I first got the call and the invitation to participate in the panel, uh, I thought, "Well, I have sort of mixed feelings about this idea." And let me tell you why my mixed feelings are, and then how I resolve my mixed feelings. Uh, first and foremost, I'm a huge soccer fan. I have followed Mexico in the last six World Cups. Starting in Mexico 86, I've been to every World Cup following Mexico. And uh, uh, even two years ago when Mexico uh, won the gold medal in the Olympics, I was not planning on going to the Olympics. I never went to the Olympics. But I watched the semifinal right here in LA. The moment that the game ended, I decided there's no way on earth that Mexico is going to play for the gold medal in Wembley against Brazil, and I'm going to watch it on TV. So within 24 hours of the end of the game, I was on a plane to London, and, uh, and I had the most amazing uh, weekend in London. It was absolutely incredible. I can cry just thinking about that moment. But uh, so uh, I love it. Uh, the idea of having Mexico host a World Cup, uh, either within Mexico and the U.S., which basically is the same, being a home team again for the World Cup is absolutely thrilling as a fan. And. Uh, uh, although I, I could also say, given that I've been to so many games uh, of Mexico throughout the world, Mexico has been a home team in every game that we have played in the World Cup for the last 30 years, except in South Africa, the opening game was against South Africa, so we were not a home game. But everywhere else, there's always 35 to 45,000 Mexicans in the stadium. It is amazing to follow Mexico in the World Cup. So anyway, so I'm thrilled with the idea, and, and as a fan, I would love that for that to happen. On the other hand, I have a really strong bend for equity. And, uh, and when I think about equity, in my lifetime, Mexico has hosted the World Cup twice. The US hosted the World Cup only 20 years ago. There are many countries in the world, there are fans all over the world that have never hosted the World Cup. Why should we do it again? And uh, uh, even England, England hosted in 1966. Many, many, many years ago, at some point, they should have a chance to host it again. But India never had it. China never had it. Vietnam never had it. These are all countries with millions of people that deserve the chance to be at the World Cup in their own country. So as I said, I have this uh, hesitation. The other hesitation I have is I did go to the World Cup in, South, in, Korea, in Korea and Japan. And, uh, and one of the problems sometimes with the World Cup is the best thing about the World Cup is the camaraderie among the fans. Yep. And for that camaraderie to happen, you need to be nearby the other fans. If you're very far apart, thousands of miles apart, it's very difficult for you to cross paths with fans from other teams that you're not playing. So that's an, a real hesitation I have. So anyway, so how do I reconcile my hesitations with my love for having Mexico play at home? And uh, I'm basically I'm an economist. So normally economists come to my rescue, and in this case, economics comes to my rescue again. Why? I'm an economist, and I see, as Ambassador Sarukan was saying a minute ago, so many untapped potential in the economic relations between Mexico and the US. NAFTA was enacted in 1994, the North American Free Trade Agreement. I remember when I was a junior faculty member at that time, I was starting to write things about trade, and I was thinking about, okay, should we do something like NAFTA? And at that point, it was completely complete inconceivable. Somebody had the bold idea to push it forward. It was a tremendous movement. And it, it's been absolutely phenomenal. Uh, it's been now 20 years. There were a lot of fears at the time of millions of displaced workers, a whole industry shutting down, all kinds of horrible stories. Economists, for the most part, were quite optimistic about what could happen. And obviously, there's been some negative effects here and there. But for the most part, it's a tremendous story of economic integration. As the ambassador was saying a minute ago, in 1993, Mexico and the US had a bilateral trade of $80 billion. Last year, bilateral trade was $500 billion. 
This is a 700% increase. Not even the most optimistic economists 20 years ago thought that trade could increase to that level. And these, I mean, and these are just overall numbers. We have industries that cannot exist today if this integration between two countries was not present. So in terms of stability, Mexico has had a stable economy now for 20 years. And uh, we had ups and downs, and now most of the ups and downs are not because of Mexico doing something wrong. It's because something going on elsewhere in the world. So in that sense, economic stability has come to Mexico. At this point, I'm an economist, and I always, when people ask me, well, Mexico, what are your biggest fears? Well, my biggest fear is what's gonna happen in the US. The Mexican economy is perfectly fine, really. The economic risk for Mexico is what could happen in the US. So, NAFTA worked, NAFTA was great. And uh, however, what have we done in the last 20 years? What other new bold idea has happened in terms of integrating the two countries? There hasn't been much. Little things here, little things there. Our relationship deserves more than that and has much more potential than that. So if the World Cup could become the catalyst for this extra integration that should happen between the countries, it would be fabulous. We are saying a minute ago that we have one million people crossing the border every day. I don't know how many times we have crossed the border. I have lived 200 miles from the border, north and the south, most of my life. So I have crossed the border many times in all different ways. I will say, let's assume that on average. I, I, I hope not in one of them. But. <laughs> yeah, 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 well, yeah, yeah, yeah. But it, let's say that it takes one hour per person to cross the border. Every time they're gonna cross, it's gonna take one hour. Many times, more, more than one. I'm saying an average of one. We're wasting one million hours of human power every day. 365 million hours wasted because we have a border that has not improved for the last 50 years. And uh, when you talk about connections by plane, most of the flights are still incredibly expensive between the two countries. When you talk about connection by rail, there's no passenger rail connection between the two countries. You cannot go by train between one country and the other. Can we have the World Cup become the catalyst? to imagine a more seamless border. One where people can cross faster, when it's easier to do it, when all the problems that we have on the borders, we solve them because we have to, to integrate the world, uh, to create, make the World Cup happen. So that way I can reconcile my equity with my fanhood for the team. So I am obviously 100% behind because I think, as we are saying a minute ago, this could be the catalyst that we need for the next bold ideas. We have better airports, we have better rail transportation, we have better border infrastructure. We start to think about how can we be checking people's uh, documents as they cross the border. We need to check them all the time. In Europe, in 1950, it would be inconceivable to think that you could cross the border between France and Germany in 30 years with no border checks at all. It happened. Can we do that in North America? Why not? We have a lot of similarities, and uh, so it would be possible. Now, can we organize it? Absolutely, yes. And that my idea is if we were to do something like this, it would have to be the southwest and the west of the U.S. with northern Mexico. It should not be all the way to the north of the U.S., all the way to the south of Mexico. I'd imagine L.A., San Diego, and Tijuana could be one of the clusters. Could be another one that could be perhaps uh, Hermosillo, perhaps uh, Torreón, and then maybe either Albuquerque or uh, Phoenix, perhaps, assuming that Phoenix changes their loss about immigration. And, uh, <laughs> otherwise, I don't want to go to Arizona. <laughs> yeah. and, uh, and then we can have another cluster that would be Dallas, Houston, perhaps San Antonio, Monterey. Probably Mexico City would have to be it, because I cannot imagine having a final World Cup not taking place at the Azteca Stadium. If you've never been at the Azteca Stadium and watch Mexico play there, you have not lived. You really should go see. But, but anyway, so to sum it up. And uh, I have hesitations in terms of equity. However, the opportunity that this could give to this bilateral relationship, and as we were said a minute ago by Michael, the way that we're gonna be able to portray the North American relationship to the world and set an example for other countries to work together is a fabulous opportunity. So we really should not waste it, and we should really push for it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Well, thank you very much for the invitation. This is a wonderful topic. I was trying to open the result of the game, but uh, I don't know. The Wi-Fi is, is not working. I mean, pretty much. One zero. One zero. Yeah. I'm leaving. Oh. <laughs> Sarukan, this is your fault. All right. All right. So, so I, I uh, now I'm uh, slightly depressed. 
<laughs> I, 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 I keep going back to the question, what would this mean for each one of the countries? And I, and I uh, again, keep going back to the idea of narrative. This is something that, for me as a journalist, is very interesting and important. And I'll start with the U.S. So since 9-11, since the U.S. hasn't hosted an event of this magnitude. It has simply become, for many people in public perception, sort of like Fortress America. I think we would all agree. So the perception is that the country is closed, not open, that this country has become the country of the TSA and ICE. That's a prevailing narrative. It certainly is a prevailing narrative when it comes to immigration reform and the Hispanic community and, uh, and Hispanic media in general. And uh, that's certainly, in my opinion, unfair and false. Of course, there's something to it, obviously, uh, uh, but it's in general unfair and false. Plus, there's a present when it comes to the United States, which is, which, which is uh, 1994. I, I was just in D.C. Uh, a couple of days ago with, with Ambassador Sarukan doing a piece on deportation, talk about narrative. And, uh, and, I, and I walked through, through Georgetown, and I started remembering how wonderful it was when the Mexican fans and the Italian fans <laughs> overtook Georgetown in 1994. Yes. I was there. And it was just, just a beautiful and amazing thing, and just a, a, a very clear illustration of what America, in, in its best uh, version, can, can, has been and can be again, in my opinion. So uh, that's, that's when it comes to when, what I think when it comes to the United States. Now, Mexico. Well, for the last seven, eight, seven or eight years, Mexico has been dominated by the narrative of violence. Violence and uh, obviously when you think of the United States or from, from the American perspective, violence and uh, the illegal immigrant narrative as well. Especially, by the way, northern Mexico. So, the, the, so as, as the United States is a country of the, of the TSA and ICE, Mexico is a country of El Chapo and the Zetas. This is also fundamentally unfair and false. I mean, I keep, I keep answering questions with my American friends. I've moved here uh, three years ago, and the first question everyone asks me is, so Mexico is a violent country all around, right? And so it takes like literally 15 minutes to explain why and how violence is focalized, how the violence has evolved uh, in Mexico in the last seven or eight years, how the situation is at the same time uh, difficult, but at the same time focalized. So this is also an unfair narrative, and I think that, uh, that a joint effort hosting the World Cup together in 2026 would be the perfect opportunity to challenge unfair narratives for both countries. And then, and then you, you go back to, obviously, uh, uh, how this would work. And I, I absolutely agree. I think this could be and should be not the Mexico-US World Cup, but the Mexica World Cup. This idea that there's there's a third country between us, not the United States, not Mexico, but a fantastic mix, which is basically the west southwest of the United States and northern Mexico. And when you look at the the the, 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 the cities in Mexico that actually host currently host first division uh, soccer teams, football teams, you have at least four great cities: Monterrey, which has two fantastic stadiums. One, one of them will, will, be, will be completely new next year. Torreón, a brand new stadium. Juárez, interesting place, but still could be, could, could, could be, could be a, a host city. Uh, Tijuana, the, the, the stadium is, is again peculiar, but it's very interesting, could be refurbished. And the United States, you have Houston, Los Angeles, Denver, Dallas, San Francisco, Miami, and San Jose. All of these are cities that currently host MLS teams and have nice stadiums, maybe not large enough for a World Cup, but still great stadiums. Of course, distance in a World Cup is an issue. When you think of Brazil, Manaus and Porto Alegre, the two farthest cities in Brazil currently hosting the, the World Cup, or that will host the World Cup in a, literally less than two months, are separated by 2,000 miles. San Francisco to Monterrey, this city is in Amexica, 1,500 miles. So even in that regard, there's an advantage. Uh, and of course, uh, there's, there's, there's an amazing and wonderful rivalry between, between the two countries, and that's also, from the journalistic perspective, but also from the basically human perspective, an amazing story. I mean, the way that uh, uh, soccer in America has evolved, and how the, the American team has evolved uh, uh, again after being dominated by the Mexican team for decades, 
it uh, grew and grew and grew until it basically became uh, quite a tough matchup between the two. And then 2002 came. Talk about depressing moments in <laughs> soccer history. The, the, American, the American team, in a fantastic match, beat Mexico in, uh, in the World Cup. And it was the defeat to rule all defeats, because until we actually get our rematch in an actual World Cup, the Americans can always go back to that and say, hell, guess what? <laughs> uh, we, we, we beat you at an actual World Cup. Uh, and, and, that, and now they got us into this World Cup. So. Exactly, and exactly. Thanks to them, we are in Brazil. So there's a, there's an amazing rivalry. It, it, it could be it could be an amazing opportunity to challenge very unfair narratives for both countries, and I and I would abs absolutely love it. I mean, I, I hope that by 2026 I'm still in LA, and we <laughs> and we get to to watch a match uh, together, Mexico, maybe a Mexico United States final. It would be amazing. So. Thank you all. Thanks, Leah. Okay. Thanks, Jay. Um, and, and thanks for the invitation, getting me back on campus. <laughs> um, in, when, 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 I, I was, when I was asked to talk about this, um, my first reaction was, huh? <laughs> and I think the reaction is going to, it comes from um, my very, very, very American side, my very gringo side, which means I'm not going to be talking about football, I'm going to be talking about soccer. Um, and th th it was the huh, because Americans don't care about soccer. I mean, that's not our sport. Our sports are football and baseball. Um, so why? Why would we want to do this? Why would this be a useful tool, um, particularly from a public diplomacy's perspective, which is what I've been asked to talk about? Um, and the more I thought about it, the more I, I and, and I've, this, the, obviously Arturo's proposal has been floating around, and I didn't really think about it ever. I just thought of it was, okay, okay good. You want to think about it? Okay. Um, a cute idea for you. <laughs> exactly. But actually having to think about it, um, the more I thought about it, the more I, I've come to accept it. It's a brilliant idea. And it's a brilliant idea um, for multiple reasons from the public diplomacy's perspective. But most importantly, I think it starts from precisely that fact, is that as Americans, we, our arrogance will not come out when we're talking about soccer, because we just don't care that much. I mean, there are obviously parts of the country that it's really, really important. But, but soccer as this weighted thing with historical identity and historical narrative and nationalistic characteristic, it just doesn't apply to the vast majority of Americans, which is a good thing, because we are going to be less possessive of it, less of our natural tendency to think we're better than the rest of the world in most things, it won't come out there. And it makes it a place that I think it'd be easier for us to think about um, working together with Mexico on this kind of, of um, a joint venture. Um, and it also makes it easier from Mexico's perspective because Mexico's attitude is completely the opposite. Um, uh, soccer is a defining characteristic, football is a defining characteristic of Mexico. It's where the Mexican nation comes together is around global competitions um, for the Mexican national team. And so it gives Mexico a, a position where it can feel very, very proud, but in a c context in which Americans uh, won't challenge that pride, work with that pride. So in that sense, it's a really interesting um, tool for thinking about this, this um, building up a, a, type, a better understanding of one another. Um, within this context, my, my jumping off point is also where I jumped off, which is sort of these, these misperceptions that we have of one another that are both historic and, and current. So how do we use public diplomacy in the context of um, a, a joint World Cup to uh, counter, not only counter these, these um, uh, misperceptions we have one another, but to create feelings of community, of neighbors, of partners that, that are really profound and at a citizen level as opposed to at a government level. And in thinking about that, I was thinking about you know, not only you know, what the message, well, the message is pretty obvious to me, the message is straightforward, the message is in some fashion North America, neighbors, partners, friends, allies. Um, but the question is, who's the best messenger for this? And I think one of the problems we've had on the public diplomacy front between the two countries is the core messenger has historically been, or messengers have been the two governments. 
and the two governments don't have a legitimacy within the publics to be able to send that message. The Mexican government telling the American public how great Mexico is gets kind of a yeah, 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 right. That's what, that, of course you would say that, and vice versa. They're not the best messenger. But the beauty, I think, of, of a joint World Cup is that you could get the societies involved. The two governments the could sectors. do things to get the societies involved, and the societies themselves become the messengers. So what are the kinds of things that we could do to get societies involved? And I started thinking about this. I was thinking about you know, two or three things. I was thinking about what we know about what works best in this process of socializing publics to new ways of thinking. But I also, because I happened to be thinking about it one evening, I was sitting in bed puzzling things, I have a poster on my wall, which is a David Hockney poster from the 1984 Olympics in LA. Um, and it just, of course, one of the things we need to do is obviously do some sort of arts exchange, arts programs, uh, and not only a, a Mundial Arts Festival, like the Olympic Arts Festival, but things that lead up to it. From the moment we get the bid, start thinking about how we can integrate more the artistic communities, which is happening in this part of, the, of our countries, I meaning in the northern part of Mexico and the southern United States, but it's not happening in the rest of our two countries. So how do you make that um, more nationwide in, in each country? Um, and um, second, high school sports exchanges. In the United States, it's high school age, junior high and high school age, where soccer is the most popular. Um, and that's the age we need to get at kids. That's the age when their brains are really, really flexible. They abs absorb new ideas. So how do you generate more um, high school level sports exchanges? And if you get those exchanges going, the soccer clubs themselves will become the messengers. And they will start tweeting. And they will use you, uh, uh, put up YouTube videos. And we can have a, a, a YouTube channel for everything associated with this, this World Cup, Joint World Cup. And they all can be posted there. So there's a place that people come to to find all that information. Um, and it's also a great opportunity to really jumpstart the Sister City program. Um, you can create all kinds of different uh, 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 pairings of cities that together work together to joint host different events. And in the societies will work together in joint hosting the high school sports and the arts and all of these other things can come together in a Sister City campaign. Um, and finally, it was just sort of just something actually I thought of driving in this morning, and Lord knows why it came to me. But as it comes closer to the time, the thing that struck me is if you can get the societies involved in this, there's no reason why we can't have flash mobs you know, related to this in some fashion. Because kids love that, and kids are going to be the ones who potentially would be doing the tweeting and stuff. And so that could happen, and that would make the news. And news, then, is one of of, of congeniality, congeniality, of collegiality, congeniality too, of collegiality, of friendship, of partnership of the societies. Um, so just some, you know, ideas sueltas that it occurred to me, but it, it, it provides a, a really great opportunity, I think, to do what we've been trying to do for the last 20, 25 years in public diplomacy and haven't quite found the message, the messenger to send the message. Sort of, I, I certainly think that there's a trove of, of very valuable ideas um, that, are, that are being pieced together as we've talked about this. Um, there's, one, there's one very relevant piece missing, which, we, we, which at this, this time we weren't able to sort of gel and materialize around the table, which is the private sector. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and per Pam's very relevant observation, that the beauty of this idea is that it posits the messenger or messengers outside of the governmental sphere and puts it within civil society and also the private sector. And given the private sector, the, the private sector, the US private sector, in many ways, has driven a lot of the discussion about North America, North American integration, played a very important role in the passage of NAFTA. Um, the, the obvious trick here will be how do we engage the private sectors of both countries, not only the big, huge uh, Fortune 100 corporations that are the traditional sponsors of something like the World Cup, you know, the Visas and Coca-Colas and uh, Canons of the world, um, but also the, the, the sort of this very dense fabric of, of 
businesses that are in integrating this, this huge achievement that NAFTA has uncorked, which is, I think, the secret sauce or the secret ingredient of why NAFTA has been so successful and reflects these numbers that are, you know, these $560 billion of trade last year uh, between Mexico and the United States, um, which is the joint, the joint integrated supply and production chains in North America, which have completely changed the face of manufacturing, of job creation, of investment, in the North American domain, if you add energy, even though that's not the topic of our, of our conversation today, but if you add energy reform in Mexico to the energy revolution that's already happening in North America, and you add energy to the equation of what has happened, you want to talk about geopolitical game changers and weaning the U.S. from less reliable sources of oil, whether it's Venezuela, Russia, or Saudi Arabia. Just think what a common North American template for energy independence, energy security, and energy efficiency entails. So if, if all of this moves in the right direction, then the private sector becomes a very important driver of this. It has to be brought into the conversation relatively early on. Mm -hmm. Again, regardless of whether you convince the Coca-Cola, the behemoths. Yeah. And then where I see the most vexing challenge is breaking down the jingoism nationalism that we will probably bump into Mm -hmm. within the soccer, the respective soccer federations of each country, mm -hmm. uh, which will say, you know, well, why should I share the World yeah. Cup with the U.S.? Or, you know, mm -hmm. uh, why should I do this with Mexico? Uh, which will not be easy to bring them on board. And there the team, the owners of teams, uh, will also play a very important well, role both in, countries in have pushing failed. The both countries have failed recently in different bids for uh, Olympics yeah. and yeah. for the World Cup. Yeah. So, I mean... Yeah. If you want to succeed, you better overcome yeah. your. Uh, yeah. 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 So, so you know, the, these these are some of the sort of, at least, this is sort of the first round of, of, of things that came to my head as I was hearing our colleagues mm -hmm. sort of discuss this this issue. If can, may I just ask if 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 people from diverse perspectives who haven't thought about this, well, I haven't thought about it a lot. Um, generally feel it's a good way to address larger issues between the U.S. and Mexico and maybe bring us closer together for, as to summarize. Just practically, um, I know you've had this idea for a little while. What are the barriers in the sense that, is it that there are other ideas being floated to bring U.S. and Mexico close together and everybody agrees upon that, that there are no ideas of the scale being there's not, a, so, there's not a single one at this scale and with this profound tectonic impact on the relationship for the next 20, 30 years. Only lack of exhibition, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. We have yeah. no borders in our We've <laughs> <laughs> already yeah. solved yeah. all those problems. Right? Yeah. We speak two languages yeah. always. I mean, but so, so for me, that, because in culture, the, you know, it's more commonplace that we think about these things all the time and mm -hmm. we see the benefits hugely. Is it apathy? I mean, I'm just asking the, these other questions. Is it that there are no ideas? Is it that there's, there's apathy? Is it that students in universities don't care enough, don't think about this problem? I mean, what, what, what would stop this from just happening? And then wouldn't it, because we have lost bids in the US, certainly in different cities, um, you know, wouldn't this be a very attractive and visible thing? Yeah. I think it's a lack of imagination and leadership, but that's why we have Arturo Saruca. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and, and talking about pragmatic things, I mean, Arturo mentioned this, the biggest barrier would be Mexico's going to say, why should I share? I mean, that we had, the, our last, we the, had the last World Cup 1986, we should have it again. So, and the U.S. going to say the same thing. We have stadiums all over the country, we can host it tomorrow, why should we share with Mexico? Is, is so that that's, true? I actually think it, you're, not, you're going to get that less from the U.S. side, but precisely no. what sure. I was saying, yeah, yeah, this yeah, is yeah. an hour sport, yeah, so we're yeah. going to be much more generous about it. Um, it, it, it the issue, I think, is yeah. more going to be on the Mexican side of should we share it. There's, yeah. there's, there's yeah. one issue which I think I, I would probably caution us, even though, it sort of, even though it reflects the reality of what is happening on this trans-border region on both sides of our common border, of sort of the idea of having this as a northern Mexico, southern U.S. or southwestern mm -hmm. U.S., what they're going to be, I think there's going to be, a, if, if, if it were to be packaged as a World Cup that doesn't, doesn't incorporate New York City yep. or doesn't incorporate Chicago or doesn't incorporate Washington or Mexico City or Guadalajara, yeah. It, yeah. it's going to be very hard to sell for a number of reasons. Yeah. Yeah. The second issue, 
pertaining to this discussion, which I think will be relevant, and Leon uh, sort of alluded this, alluded to this, it, it is there, there may be some very significant bureaucratic governmental resistances of what a, an event of this magnitude would entail for DHS and Homeland Security, um, yeah. simply in terms of not only a very high, huge, concentrated inflow of tourists and fans and teams and media and uh, in a very short span of time, mm -hmm. but also in terms of the requirements for everything from the expedition of visas to this, yeah. this, could, this could be a challenge, sort of beyond convincing the federations, beyond convincing the big historic sponsors of the World Cup, the first immediate thing that I think we need to think of is something which you Jorge alluded to, which was sort of the, the seamless borders, mm -hmm. which is this huge conundrum, mm -hmm. which in fact sort of reflects what we've been discussing, that if you look at, the, if you look at NAFTA and you, you look at the economic relationship and what NAFTA has triggered between Mexico and the United States since 1993, we could basically say that today Mexico and the United States have a 21st century trade relationship, because of the reasons that we were discussing, numbers, dynamics, joint logistics, mm -hmm. integrated supply and production. We've got a 20th century framework, because NAFTA was negotiated in 1993, 20 years ago. Yes, at the time it was the most ambitious free trade agreement. It was the gold standard of free trade agreements, the first free trade agreement, may I remind you all, between a developing and a developed nation. and so. A lot of things have happened in the global economy since we negotiated NAFTA. And so if you look at, for example, the TPP negotiations today and the, the standards, the criteria that are being built into the negotiations, NAFTA is in diapers compared to, I, I say NAFTA was a 1.0 free trade agreement, TPP is a 3.0 free trade agreement. So NAFTA is a 20th century infrastructure, uh, I, I mean is a 20th century framework, but if you look at borders, mm -hmm. We've got a 19th yeah, century absolutely. border absolutely. Yeah. and border absolutely. infrastructure. Yeah. So as, 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 as you think of some of the challenges and the pushback, we, we, we may have some very heavy lifting to ensure that our government bureaucracies, procedures um, are in line with something with, uh, the, that would have the magnitude of this enterprise. Yeah. I mean, there's no question that there will be barriers. However, the way I will see it is, the concept of NAFTA was much more revolutionary mm -hmm. in 1990 than this would be. I mean, in 1990, it was absolutely mm -hmm. inconceivable to have Mexico and the U.S. have free trade. It was, I mean, the history of Mexico for the 20th century was completely against that principle. And uh, so the fact that within three years, we were able to approve it, get it done, and start putting it into place is possible. So anybody that says there's a barrier for this, a barrier for that, we can always go back and say, you know, in three years, we made that happen. Here, we're talking about 2024. We're talking about... 20 years on the road, or 10 years on the road, 12 years on the road. Lots of time. Yeah, lots of time. There'll be barriers, and uh, there'll be naysayers the same that there were when NAFTA was going to be enacted. Yeah. Just a matter of making it happen. Well, I have one question I wanted to hear the speaker's um, observations. How would this joint bid narrative be seen or interpreted, understood by the rest of the world? I mean, this we've been just talking about this yeah. in a very bilateral context. I think uh, you all yeah. make very strong cases mm -hmm. for coming together. but. What does it mean to the rest of the world? I, I sort of that's 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 what I was sort of trying to point to, which I think is, do, do you imagine the signal that it would send the rest of the world that these two countries that started out where they started out in 1993 with the negotiation, where, well, the agreement with NAFTA that have achieved what they have achieved, that still have the asymmetry of power that we we have between both nations today, whether it's economic, political, or military. But do, do you imagine that the the message that it sends of of, of a growing sense of co-stakeholdership, of this convergence that I was talking about, which again may not be very popular in Mexico or in the US, but I think is a very profound reality of what has happened between Mexico and the United States, which is a growing convergence of both nations and both societies. Um, I, I, I think it would be a very powerful signal of, of how two countries that started at a very disparate uh, position uh, uh, on everything from trade to how we engage regarding global issues around the world, 
are coming together, converging, and creating a sense of co-stakeholdership for the well-being, security, and prosperity of both our citizens. But also more broadly in the world, I think different countries are going to look at Mexico differently and look at the United States differently, not only for the better, but also for the worse. It's going to be a mixed bag, I think. Undoubtedly. And, 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 I, and we have to obviously have to keep that in mind, um, that yeah. those um, intended and unintended consequences, if one were to try Undoubtedly. to with this. Undoubtedly. I would probably respond, Pam, as sort of the recovering Mexican diplomat in the room. <laughs> um, regarding Canada, I fully agree. Um, the problem there is our, in all, in all frankness, our Canadian friends have isolated themselves from the debate over how you deepen this trilateral architecture yeah, yeah. for the past at least 10 years. Yeah. The Canadians have been yeah. AWOL. Yeah. And so, um, yes, they may feel the way you've described, but uh, given that they seem to believe that their preference is for ensuring the vitality of their bilateral relationship with the United States over the development of the trilateral edifice. And as I mentioned this, I, I can't avoid but saying, triggered by the second <coughs> loss that we face, that we've lost two great spokespersons for this idea of North America, Bob Pastor a few months ago, and uh, our dear Sidney Weintraub, who passed away a week ago, who, who, who were always great proponents of of this greater convergence in North America. Now, and our Canadian friends don't seem to have the appetite for that edifice, or at least haven't seemed to have, that, have had that appetite for quite some time. Plus, they're terrible at soccer. Absolutely terrible at soccer. I mean, yes, 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 our friends in NAFTA, they're terrible at soccer. Well, we need a couple of things like that in the region, so we don't just With the argument of, oh, you know, this proves that Mexico isn't Latin America. Well, you know, I know that that has been Brazil's argument in mm -hmm. an effort to strategically decouple Mexico and the United States from mm -hmm. South America, mm -hmm. the argument that there isn't Latin America, there's a South America, there's a Central America, there's a North America. But I think, I think you know, regardless of what's be, be behind Brazil's um, articulation of this sense of geography and geopolitics, they're absolutely right. Um, I, don't, I, don't think there's Latin, I don't think there's a homogeneous Latin America today. Again, look at the Pacific Alliance, something that I think we've talked about in the past when I've been here at USC. Uh, I think in many ways the Pacific Alliance is an alternative construct to the Mercosur, UNASUR paradigm. In many ways a coalition of the free trade willing nations of the Americas that have free trade agreements with the United States that are on the Pacific, that some of them, some of us are linked to, whether it's via APEC or the TPP, to new economic and trade paradigms. So, yeah. Um, I also agree that not, and again, that's why I preceded what I said, bless you, I preceded what I said uh, in the, my opening remarks, that not everyone in Mexico or the United States will enjoy having me say that there is a real convergence taking place between Mexico and the United States, which, which is there, and it's palpable in, in every sphere of our interaction. Yeah. Uh, just to ask another question, I, I think that um, under the... Uh, auspices of the idea that uh, the enemy is also always within. It will, it will be us who yeah, will yeah. stop the idea. Mm -hmm. It will be within our own, won't be from outside. Mm -hmm. um, I, I wonder, because the narrative does go to securities and borders, even if NAFTA has been successful, mm -hmm. the language is so much about borders now and mm -hmm. these questions about borders. Mm -hmm. I recently heard an NPR uh, story on the radio about how Phoenix is backpedaling as fast as they can because they've seen the negative results mm -hmm. of, mm -hmm. of that kind of, of SB 1070. Of, yes, of course. I so won't go that stage. I would ask a kind of deeper question or, or in preparation for this: Are there obvious ways that that narrative can be smoothed over? What's underneath it? How do you respond and not get the dialogue to go right where it always goes, which is? borders and safety, which is in the U.S., where we go, yeah, 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 yeah. how do you immediately be prepared to counter that as soon as, you know, it goes public? And, and isn't that what might kill it right away? And how do you be really prepared to say, no, both it's, it's sports, we should do it for sports, it's temporary, and, you know, what are the, what's underneath all that to stop the negative reaction from within? Is there an obvious... I think well, it's, I mean, uh, you, you have a matter of, of, of logistics as well when it comes to the World yeah. Cup, and you could make it work logistically. Uh, certainly, for example, if we have, we have a, 
cities like San Diego and Tijuana host uh, host a couple of groups and and the border crossing is as it is now that's a disaster yeah. I mean we have to fix yeah, it absolutely. I mean first of all we have to really fix yeah. the infrastructure once you do that you can work around logistics and try to convince people in, in board meetings in, in meeting rooms like this uh, uh, that, that, that the World Cup might work. When it comes to public perception, I'm not, I'm not as worried. Uh, and I, I think that, that in Mexico, we, the idea would be better received than we, than we think. And uh, mm -hmm. honestly, I think when, when Pam was saying that Americans don't care about soccer, I disagree. I think Americans care about soccer, but I think they care about soccer in the best way possible. It's, 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 a, sport that, it's a sport that's seen in, in the most beautiful light, uh, and I can see this with, with uh, in, in, I have personal stories with, with the, my kids' friends, but also I have numbers to prove it. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a sport that's going, that's all over the place. The yeah. number of people that are playing it is enormous, not only kids, but also mm -hmm. grown-ups. So the numbers are there, and I think that when it comes to public perception, it's, it, would be, it would be just a, a celebration of a, of a, sport, a beloved sport uh, differently, loved differently in both sides of the border, but still a beloved yeah. sport in, in both countries. Yeah. On, on that point, and uh, the perception of soccer in America in 12 years is going to be so different than it is today. Just think back. Yeah, where was football 12 years yeah. ago in the United yeah. States? They might I, even I, win the World Cup. Yeah, well, let's hope not. Yeah, the other day. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but I mean, I do remember when the World Cup was here in the United States. I mean, I, I follow Mexico in, to Washington, to Seattle, uh, Orlando, etc. And a lot of the people in the city will look at you and thinking, oh, yeah, these are the people here for the polo tournament or something. Mm -hmm. I mean, they sort of knew that there was some international tournament going on, and, but they really didn't understand that the World Cup was being held in the U.S. Think about today. That would not happen today. Oh, no. And, and the no. kids that are in high school right now are going to have kids in 12 years. Yeah. So it's going to be a whole different population that will be enjoying it. Mm -hmm. so, anyway, that's yeah, exactly ahead. the point I was trying to get at, is that I mean, soccer is, is, is a, a sport of youth and their parents, in effect, in the United mm -hmm. States. Yeah. Uh, it's not a sport weighted with history. It's not a that's sport true. weighted yeah, with yeah, national yeah. identity. Yeah, yeah. And that's why I think it actually makes, it, yeah. it is the makes perfect sense. Um, yeah. 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 Oh, an outstanding vehicle, not the perfect vehicle.